The following interview was conducted with John A. Sauter, Vice President for Housing and Food Services for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, March 24, 2010 in Stewart Center. This is part two of the interview, and the interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Good afternoon, John, and thank you very much. Thank you. Let's start off with uh, the master plan. Talk to us a little bit about that. Uh, well, 20 and 30 years down, when you and I are mm -hmm. gonna be long gone. <laughs> Well, we've had several housing master plans as well as one food service consolidation plan. And uh, to put it in perspective, we're just wrapping up our first housing master plan. And that is, we think it's uh, just a, a, a good idea to be forward thinking and be planning very intentionally for the future so that those that uh, come here after us will have some idea of where we're headed and perhaps even have a little nest egg, perhaps some money put aside uh, for them. And so our first housing master plan is pretty well complete. We just opened up a brand new hall for street towers. Our food service consolidation plan is complete. We've gone from 11 kitchen dining rooms down to five. And so it was time for the next one. And so we hired Sasaki and Associates out of Boston, same company that did the campus master plan. We thought it was astute to hire the same company that did the campus plan because they'd have that ready knowledge available. And so we've worked with them for over a year now. And that, uh, that study is complete. And it has us thinking, uh, first of all, about the campus, which is going to become much more pedestrian oriented. So Third Street will become more of a, almost a, a, a walking pedestrian mall street as opposed to the busy street that it is now. Um, State Street becomes not a divider, but a, but a gatherer in terms of there'll be more uh, retail, there'll be more stores, they think. On State Street, up and down State Street, it will not be a through street anymore. It won't be a, a state highway uh, once the 231 route comes in. I was going to ask you about in. that. That'll, that impacts the study, though, doesn't it? It does. It becomes a, 231 becomes a bypass, and 26 goes around the campus. And so 26 State Street, as we know it now, would actually not be through. You could not get through it. So they think that will deter traffic. And so, again, it's going to bring the campus together. Mm -hmm. So within that context, they started developing a master plan, thinking of where they could put additional facilities. And so. They'd, they've identified current green spaces. They've identified current parking lots. Um, my area, in fact, where my building, Smalley Center, is the Meredith Hall, go away uh, to establish a green spot, you know, that sort of thing. In the Purdue Family Housing Area, there's a much better way to make better use of the real estate down there. But the two pockets they identified that are getting immediate attention uh, one is uh, the Hayes Triangle area, and that's an area by the current McDonald's and Credit Union area there. There's a triangle which has Stadium on one side, and I believe it's Grant on one side and Hayes Street on the third, sure. and it'd become the Hayes Triangle. The Research Foundation owns about 70% of those lots, so that could become an, uh, a housing space for graduate students right there in that community area. But the most amount of interest right now is going to the, what we're calling the southeast quadrant of campus, and that's the area between Dauk Alumni Center and Free Hafer Hall on Grant Street. And so there's a lot of private homes in that area right now. 80% uh, of those lots are owned by the Purdue Research Foundation. And so the thought is, and it's been identified by Sasaki, that that's an area on campus that is uh, woefully behind when it comes to campus housing for students. And if you even think of dining options in that area for those students, uh, they're not readily available, and so that ought to be a focus area. Good. And so that's the area that's being focused on. Now, at the same time, our trustees are becoming more uh, uh, involved in terms of the quality of housing and the style of housing that we build. And so uh, it, it's their thought now, again, being driven by trustees, that maybe we ought to be thinking at a different kind of building not a hundred year building like we build now, but 30 and 40 year type buildings, more that the private sector builds, where you use it for 30 or 40 years, demolish it, and you kind of start over with something more relevant to the students of that particular generation. Different way of looking at buildings than, than, we're, than we're used to doing. If you think of Doomy Hall, it was here in 34, and Cary in 27. The other dynamic that they're encouraging us to look at is having private developers come in. So instead of the university investing its money, its capital, to help finance these buildings, wouldn't there be a private company out there, like a private company that finances malls, where they come in and buy an area of a town 
and they basically create a mall. A finance company comes in, buys or is leased this land, and then they contract with a housing, private housing company to actually build housing there. So that's being studied. And a whole new concept of maybe having retail stores on the first floor and then building housing on the second, third, and fourth floors of that particular area. Mm -hmm. Completely different way to look at this. And so that is being pursued now. There is a committee that is being chaired by the Research Foundation folks. And they're actually seeing if finance companies would be interested in doing something like this. Our legal people are looking at the legality of state property being used or leased to a private company. We're looking at it from a campus housing standpoint that if you're going to call this university housing, what does that mean? Does that mean we manage it? Does that mean that we have resident assistance on the floors? Uh, does that mean it's our rules and regulations? Does that mean we have to collect the money through our bursar's office? A lot of questions right now um, as a part of this newest master plan. So a completely different way to look at it, a uh, completely different way to think about the product that we're going to put in that part of campus. Very interesting. But all part of this new master plan that in 20 to 30 years uh, we'll know the answer to a lot yeah. of those questions. When the first three towers, that was, a, uh, was that part of the plan initially, the other plan? I mean, how did that come about? Because that was a new concept, residence hall type. Right. right. First Street Towers was the end of our first master plan okay. Okay. Uh, for the property that was formerly uh, occupied by Fowler Courts. Right. Um, our thinking on that was that we needed uh, a, a, a new style of a product. We needed to enhance our entire housing inventory stock. So we have plenty of, and probably too many, of double-loaded corridors, which are rooms on both sides of a hallway with the gang or the group bathroom. With Hill and Brand that opened in 93, we had suites, where two rooms shared a bath. In our apartments at Purdue Village and in Hilltop Apartments, it's an apartment arrangement. Uh, we needed something to uh, uh, en enhance our inventory. We also needed a product that would retain more upper-class students. So we needed what we call a move-up option. And we did some market research by surveying some students, and what they told us was it's not that they tire of living on campus, they just want a different view. They kind of want to be able to move to something maybe a little nicer. So with those thoughts in mind, we started looking what's going on across the country, and we found our friends at Penn State doing something that we found attractive, and that was they were building clusters or pods. They had patterned theirs after Stanford University. Out there, they're called houses. So if you live in a house, you all live in a certain kind of a community, all related to the same major, perhaps. Penn State took it one step larger and built it a large facility. And they actually had nine rooms in a, in a pod. And it was a private room with a private bathroom. And the nine students would share a family room, a kitchen, a study room, and a laundry area. So they were kind of self-sufficient. The value or the attraction to the upper class student was you could have privacy if you wanted it, but you could be a part of community when you thought you needed it. So that's what we kind of had in mind. So we planned, we must have worked over three years on that concept to get it to fit on that piece of property. Unfortunately, the cost of construction started going up. So whereas we wanted nine rooms in a cluster like they had, pretty soon it was 12, pretty soon it was 15, pretty soon it was 19, uh, we ended up with 22 rooms in a cluster uh, just to make it affordable, such as it was. We had planned to put around 550 beds there, and we had estimated about $60 million would do that for us. The cost of construction, again, took another sharp uptick, and we found that for 52 of the $60 million, we could only build two of the towers. So we had a decision day, and I can still remember the meeting in a conference room in Smalley Center where the committee is kind of scratching their heads thinking maybe we ought to abandon this and just go back to those suites or apartments. And I said, no, uh, this is a new concept. It's going to be attractive, I think, to our students. It's going to enhance this inventory. The whole concept is still there. I think it'll work. And so we went ahead and uh, I ha had thoughts of Arby Stewart, of what he must have been thinking with Doomy Hall when he built that in 34, and all the Windsor Halls are so expensive that he phased them. And so I thought That's if Arby... added on to them, is that the way it was done? That's right. Okay. Over, in fact, Doomy Hall opened in 34, and I think Vauder opened in 53. So they were phased almost over 20 years because it was very expensive housing. And that was my clue. Expensive housing, that's what we're doing. 
we'll phase it. But first, let's see if these are popular. So we went ahead, got the bids, did the construction, and just about a year ago, in February of 2009, is the day that we put it on the market to see if the students would go for it. And we put it on the market, and in two days it sold out, and we had enough on a waiting list, we could have filled the third tower right then. So that was a happy day for us when we realized we had something the students would find attractive, would be willing to pay for it, and uh, which is why we're now going ahead and we're going to start the third tower this summer. Okay. And you, got the, and you allowed for that. You got the space for it. We have the space for it. We have the infrastructure. This fall, as it turns out, this facility gained a lot of national attention. Okay. We were on uh, ABC uh, Morning Show and CBS. We actually made the New York Times and the Chicago Tribune. Uh, being compared to other facilities like this in the country, there aren't a whole lot, but it was built as a luxury hall. And so we're not sure we like that particular title, but it got us some publicity right. and it got folks aware of it. It's not for everybody. Right. Uh, we're going to add 174 more beds, so we'll have about 550 or so yeah. uh, rooms of this nature. It also lends itself for conferences, and that was another one of our motivations. Right. So as groups come in, perhaps executives, or all ages might want to come in for a conference to live in together in a group, one of our clusters, it's going to be ideal for that. You could use that in the summer, though. That would be Absolutely. The summer, cause that would so we think it's going to be a very attractive offering right. then. So, I, so I, I, I feel very good about that now. Sounds good. Let's talk about funding for the residence halls for the researchers. They're, it, they're financially self-supporting. Yes, they are. Right. We're financially... Always have been. Uh, and always have been, meaning we rely on room and board income, summer conference income, another income that we can generate. So we, we can be a little bit of the entrepreneurs on campus if we can think of a way to generate some income that provides a value uh, for our students. So no state revenue, no general funds, no 10 funds come into our operations. We pay the university for all, f for all services. So from heat, That's a challenge. electricity, heat, water, uh, uh, all those sorts of trash pickup, all the variety of things you can think of, police support, uh, the use of physical facilities and all the variety of support areas across the campus. Uh, we're billed for that uh, pretty substantially, right. uh, but we've made it work. But it also gives us a, a sense of independence in that we have to go after summer conferences. Right. And whereas before we used to view summer conferences as a change of pace, it was something different to do, it slowed down a little bit, now we actively actually go after conference large groups in particular to try to attract them. We encourage departments to have groups on campus, athletics, to have uh, sports camps, all those sorts of things uh, if we possibly can. Plus we keep coming up with uh, other kinds of offerings, as I mentioned, for students. And the two more successful that we are, are involved with these days, the first is something called a treat pack offering. And that is we have our own website where you can go to and order any of a dozen different kinds of uh, packages that include food and snacks, as well as some Purdue paraphernalia and we'll send it to your son or daughter on their birthday or before a big test or whatever the occasion might be. I became aware of this when I went to a website and you can do this nationally. If, if you have a son going to school in Arizona, you can do the same thing and this national company performs this service. I thought, we're big enough, we can do this. Great. And so we're doing that now and we have hundreds of parents who take advantage of it and we're making thousands of dollars with this nice value added service. Good. The other one we're doing right now is a textbook rental program. I became aware of that with uh, our private bookstores off campus, that they're feeling the pinch of internet textbook services. Right. All, the all the students aren't buying their textbooks from the local providers anymore. So I thought, would they be interested in a contract where they might even pay us to actually get textbooks to our students, in fact, delivered to our students? And they are. So it's on a contract, Follis is our current provider, and the way this works is that if a student is gonna live with us next year and gives us their schedule, or if a freshman this coming summer gives us their class schedule, we'll provide that to Follett's bookstore and they'll have their books waiting for them in their residence hall when they arrive this fall. And then in turn, Follett's is given the opportunity to buy the books back, and of course that's where they make their money, right. and that's where we make some of our money. So it's become a value-added service. Our students don't have to stand in line anymore at the bookstores. And of course, the local bookstore enjoys it also. Yeah, and using our facility, the, the local people. That's right, right, that's right. So it's an example of, of thinking of something value-added. We can make a little bit of money off, off uh, to help 
can I keep our room and board rates down if we possibly can? Sure. And so, and those are two that work. We've had some others that don't work as well, but but we keep trying. We keep trying new things like that. You like to be creative. That's we do. John. I agree. We with really you. do. And how about the uh, your repair and rehabilitation? You've been doing that for a while. You've got uh, you're doing with Harrison that spring, you know, and getting <coughs> going green. Has mm -hmm. to change over time. Yeah, this gets back to our master plan. Right. Uh, part of our master plan was renovation of rooms and thinking of what's going to be happening 10, 20, and 30 years down, but also our current facilities. And, and two uh, thoughts and drivers came out of that that resulted in some action plans. One is for sprinklers. Um, fire safety in residence halls is always uh, a, a sensitive topic. It's a national um, awareness issue that you always read about unfortunate situations. And so I guess it was 10 years ago, now we have a 12 year plan and we're in our 10th year. So about 10 years ago and a little before that we started thinking we need to get sprinklers in all of our facilities. So it was not mandated, it was not funded, but we decided with this master plan we were putting together, it was the right thing to do. So over a 12 year period of time, we're phasing sprinklers, water, piping water into all of these buildings uh, to provide sprinklers, in-room sprinklers, in uh, realizing that we're operating. So we could only do a third of a building a summer. So you do one wing, you do the other wing, and then you do the central area, because we couldn't interrupt the operation or the summer conference activity for, uh, for too long, because we rely on the income. And so it's, it's been a, a long <laughs> process. Harrison is the last hall right now uh, in the current scheduling scheme that's going to be going through this. I think we're in the second or third phase of that. Uh, same way with air conditioning. We thought as long as we're piping water in the building, if you would pipe chilled water into the building in some facilities, you could actually run it through a compressor and you end up with air conditioning. So we determined that 70% of our space should probably be air conditioned. Uh, this is primarily for summer conference activity. Uh, our current students like it also. But it, in reality, the first two weeks of the semester and the last two weeks of the semester are probably uncomfortable. But for 80 years, we've been making it just fine without. And so uh, we decided for summer conference business, again, this, this would probably be the thing to do. So we established a 12-year plan. And so in some buildings, as we pipe water in for sprinklers, we also then incorporate that into an air conditioning scheme. So basically, all of our high-rise buildings are the ones that are going to be air conditioned. So McCutcheon and Harrison, Earhart and Shreve, Hill and Brand was air conditioned when we built it. Hawkins was air conditioned when we built it. In the renovated space in Cary, that's air conditioned. And Windsor Halls, which are going on right now, that space will be air conditioned. So 70% of the space will be air conditioned. That brings up a point you were mentioning earlier, part of the master plan, you're going to have an area maybe around Hayes for grad students. Right now, you only have one facility, don't you, the, the graduate houses? We used to have the two. So you're thinking we, used to have, yeah. we used to have Young Graduate House right. and Hawkins Graduate House, almost misnomers. I mean, they were two-thirds graduate students. The other trend that started occurring is our graduate students really preferred to cook their own meals. Those halls, although they had nice rooms, nice single rooms, they didn't have cooking facilities. And so they were becoming less popular with graduate students. Mm -hmm. In fact, our Purdue Village area now has become more popular with our graduate students because they can prepare meals. Mm -hmm. A about the same time then the university needed office space quickly. As a part of their master plan, they, needed, they were going to hire 300 additional faculty. And so in a matter of two years, they needed 300 offices. And there was Young Hall just sitting there. And so now it's fully occupied with offices. Hawkins is the last one. And we've even taken the graduate word out of its name. So it's Hawkins Hall. Uh, we do house a fair number of graduate students. Uh, but not a lot anymore. Mm -hmm. So the graduate housing is something that we have to get into this next master plan. Yeah, I see. Good point. Okay. Now, residence halls, the student in residence halls. A couple comments that you had made. Um, the student retention and GPA, and um, you mentioned it a little bit earlier about the standalone dining course, but just maybe another comment on that, which is really a change mm -hmm. from the cafeteria and the ones in the, in the hall itself. Right. Starting with uh, the, the, the new dining courts first, perhaps, that was the food service consolidation plan that we mm -hmm. got into. Right. Uh, that started around the mid-90s, 1995, 96, when we saw a trend. And that was that even though we had 20 meals a week, uh, a master menu, meaning everybody served hot dogs at the same time, 
and we had dining courts and kitchens in all of our 11 halls, so convenience was a real plus. That even takes us back to the 1950s when the, when the university actually stopped teaching from 12 to 1 o'clock every day, and the students were all expected to go back to their residence hall and get their food. And I, so if you I had not heard that before. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Interesting. If you think of uh, Wiley, Tarkington, and Owen, and you might recall, they have a lot of entrances and exits out of those dining rooms. Right. That was so you would enter the side and come out the front because the students had to get in and out within an hour to be able to get back to class. And that ended probably about the late 50s, early 60s um, or so right. when on the, uh, the wave of students wanting to take more classes, uh, and Jim Blakesley was known famously for this. He would always be contacting me about the number of students who really were requesting to uh, waive and sign away their lunch hour if they could get the class they wanted. And that then brought with it the whole concept of teaching actually between 12 and 1, and if a student wanted to waive their lunch hour, they could. And so they started signing off, although he still kept a, a, a time block for me for the students in Harrison and McCutcheon Hall. So if at all possible, they had enough time to get back to their halls to eat, to get back to campus. Good point. <laughs> well, that all started changing. Sure. And pretty soon the students were skipping lunches and they didn't really care. And pretty soon they were skipping a lot of their meals. And we noticed our absenteeism was at about a third, 33%, approaching 40%. Students were missing 40% of their meals and were starting to move off campus because the, they could tell mom and dad, I can save you money by going off campus. I won't miss as many meals. Even though we counted on them missing meals, uh, they were missing more than we thought uh, they should comfortably be missing. At the same time, more financial aid was arriving on campus for our students, and the impact of that was less students were working. And uh, the way we were set up, we relied on about 150 to 200 students per hall to work in our kitchens with their nice waiter jackets that they used to wear with the ties and that sort of thing. A lot of banquets and dinner dances, you may recall, that we used to go to. Um, we started becoming uh, more casual, and we had less students working for us. So we started doing some research with the students and, and uh, asking them about the items they like to eat. So for instance, would they be willing to leave their hall and go to the hall next door if they could get a steak? And the answer was, well, probably. So we had steak night. It cost us a small fortune. But on one night, I think it was a Tuesday night of some fateful week in October back then, uh, six of the 12 halls served steak. And sure enough, the students wouldn't mind leaving their hall to get the item they wanted. That started telling us the students wouldn't mind moving to get the item they wanted. So more research told us they wouldn't mind walking two buildings away from where they live to get the food item they wanted. So that told us we had to be start thinking about neighborhoods, a neighborhood concept. And so we didn't need 11 kitchen and dining rooms. We needed probably five. In fact, we thought we needed 3,000 seats to serve the community that we're serving. Um, knowing that there's turnover, we actually timed how long it would take to eat a meal. Dinner is always longer than breakfast, that sort of thing. And so to get 3,000 seats, we thought we needed five dining rooms. And so we built two freestanding dining courts. And we've renovated three kitchens, Hillenbrand, Earhart, and uh, Windsor to have three uh, built-in new concepts. And then we took it several steps further. By then we knew and we could see the trends in malls and airports where you have what's called a marketplace concept and that is you have different choices. There they all have brand names. But we could do that same thing. We're self-op and we thought we could do that same sort of thing. Uh, we put a chef in each of those locations. We decided to have specialty items in each of those locations to give students some choices. We knew that 17% of our population preferred vegan and vegan and vegetarian style food. So we needed that in one of the locations. So that together with a consultant, together with studying trends, uh, got us on our way to, to the dining courts uh, that we have these days, the very popular uh, dining courts. Uh, we are probably on the cutting edge in terms of college dining right now with those dining courts. Uh, folks are catching up with us. Uh, everybody's doing this, we're, we're just larger uh, th than most of the halls are. So Ford Dining Court has 800 seats in it, Wiley Dining Court, the newest, has 500 uh, sizable, and it takes a lot of people at once, mm -hmm. uh, and, but our students have gotten used to that, and, and at, initially we thought, well, when the line's outside, 
and it's a little chilly, surely they'll go to another hall. But no, they, they prefer. They know they'll be inside in five minutes. Some of us older folks have to get used to that. Um, but now we find it's, it's popular with the campus community. Uh, we sold a thousand meal contracts off campus uh, this past fall. We have uh, faculty and visiting professors buying dining cards. We have coaches buying dining cards to bring in recruits. We're a part of the recruitment effort to attract students to Purdue. Good. And we take all visiting parents and, and students through our dining courts because we like the food and it's really become a driver for us. You're talking about the, uh, one thing that comes to mind and people have asked me, the, uh, the coach's table for the football so is it's still in, in Cary. It is, Cary Northeast in the basement. Right. It's, we has call it, it always the, been in there? It's, it's always been there. We call it the All-American Dining Room. <laughs> and that goes back to the days of the Red Mackey, Jack Smalley days, oh, okay. where Jack Smalley agreed that he would have the facility, athletics would not have to invest in it at all. We would run it, and, and, and they would use it, and we would charge them, that sort sure. of thing. And that has carried over to today, and we've upgraded it. Oh, yeah. And uh, it's very, very attractive. Well, and it's close. I mean, that's about as close as you can get to the facilities. It is. You know, for them. So that's just we, really We love to hear the coaches talk about some of them that have been to many schools. This is as attractive and as close a training uh, table operation as they've ever been a, a part of. And it's good food. We have a great relationship with the folks, and the trainers pick out the food. And, and uh, it's just a matter of which sport eats there. That's you know, very good. That sort of thing. Um, the student input, this is quite interesting, design and renovation of the facilities. Did they have some committees, or how did that come about? Uh, lots of committees, lots right. of input uh, involved in, in the decisions relative to what's to be included. Uh, and I can still remember when I, the light bulb finally went on in my head relative to student input. And it would go back to probably the early 80s when I was director of housing. And we have the, our own campus cable television system. And I was considering whether we had MTV as a station in our station lineup. And so I talked to the parents about it, and they would say, oh, we don't want you doing that because we're paying too much money for our children to be sitting in front of that TV set up in their rooms, so we prefer that you wouldn't do that. I asked the students what they thought about it, and they said, you know, we've had MTV on in our room at home for the last four years during high school. In fact, we don't even watch it. It's kind of background music for us. Just on. Just on. That told me always ask the students, you know, you're going to get the insight you're looking for from the students. Mm -hmm. So ever since then, focus groups uh, and surveys, um, with First Street Towers in particular, we really went the extra mile as we got close to the concept for that, 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 that facility and the room and the bathroom, we actually built a mock room scaled to size with furniture and we would actually parade students over there through that facility. We even had fact fellows, we had staff, we had a lot of folks go through the rooms, give us feedback. What do you like? What don't you like? The way the door swings, the way the closet looks, all those sorts of things. Uh, so yeah, student input along the way. We still have student input in our food service operation. We have monthly food testing available. So we're still testing and refining a lot of our items, everything from ketchup, for example, to uh, particular items. My, my, my greatest story, my favorite story with uh, the food testing uh, was uh, happened about three or four years ago where we used to have an item called Johanna Mazzetti. You may remember it's an Italian dish, but the take on the item started going down. And so we're always rotating items. But for this one, we were kind of concerned. So we, it finally made its way up the agenda to one of those food testings. And the students tasted it and liked it. And so the, the staff asked the students, what, what do you attest this kind of decline in the take? And they said, well, it's the name. The name is kind of, conf it doesn't tell us anything about the item. So they thought about it and we changed the item to cheeseburger casserole. And it's now back up as one of our more popular items. In fact, I had it today for lunch. Cheeseburger casserole, very same item. Again, student input told us Very good. <laughs> you have to be in tune with, with how they're thinking and what's going on. We don't know how to spell it, let alone pronounce that's it. Right. That's right. That's right. I don't want to, I'm not sure what's in it, so I'm not going to have that's it. Right. That's right. That's right. And we're all that way. <laughs> oh. Now, the, uh, how, the rates here uh, on campus and the ward rates, that's, that's a challenge, isn't it? To, the re get to come up with the rates every year for them. Right, the room and board rates. Right, the room and board, yeah. Yeah, our, our tradition has been that we normally do that in uh, December. 
take it to the trustees, uh, which is earlier than most schools, we always think students need to know what the amount is that they'll be recontracting for as they compare other facilities off campus. And as early as they possibly can for the upcoming that, year. That's right. And so we start the planning of that around the first part of October of the, of that, of the fall semester. So we've only had about a month of activity uh, to start gauging what our prices might be. And so, uh, so we're actually uh, estimating way in advance what we think uh, the additional room and board costs are going to be. Uh, and what we've been doing lately is, is incorporating these master plan fees into that room and board rate increase. And so the, there's a, there was a small fee for the air conditioning, a small fee for the sprinkling, a small fee for the master plan overall, and then inflationary increase. And so what would the market bear? What would be a fair cost to the, to the, to the families? We also always then do a Big Ten comparison, and we always try to position ourselves in the middle of the Big Ten. And so Northwestern private school always tended to be the most expensive. Um, Iowa, up until most recently, tended to be the least expensive. And then we were kind of in the middle. In the middle. Those comparisons are becoming much more difficult in that 70% of our space will be air conditioned, and many campuses don't have that much. So which rate do you use? Uh, board contracts, we all do it a little bit differently these days in terms of what an average board contract might be. Uh, so the comparison part is becoming a challenge. Um, but we're always looking to see what a fair room and board rate might be, keeping in mind the rest of the university and... and uh, right. What and, about the food, and, uh, your food thing, you have to factor that in too. Don't you? Right. Right. And we, that's a, that, that must be very difficult. It is. We, we have meal contracts. Right. Uh, 10, 12, 15, and 20 is what we've gotten to now instead of the 120 plan that we have. Um, we always try to give students the choice, and it varies right now between the 12 and the 15. The 12 is becoming uh, the more popular uh, meal plan, so that's kind of the price we use for that. But yeah, trying to guess right. the cost of the food items. Uh, we've actually also improved the quality of our food. Uh, for instance, I'm not allowed to say hamburger anymore. I always have to say Angus burger because it's a better quality of, of beef that they're getting for that. Those sorts of things, we're always continuing uh, uh, to assess. Also, uh, we're always looking at food waste, of course. That's, that's one of our, our enemies out there. These days, we're looking at things like uh, many schools are going trayless. Uh, we're, we're one of, if you think about it, we're one of the few buffets that you might ever go to where you carry a tray that carries all your dishes. If you go to any place in town, you always have to have the dishes. That's, that's pretty intentional because you're going to have a limit on how many dishes you can manage. John, I always have a problem with the entree and the salad. I, you know, I just don't have another hand. And uh -huh. many people just do the one dish and then they'll come back or whatever. That's right. It, it is hard to balance it. It's hard to juggle that. If you that. put the salad on the entree, it sort of runs into whatever. And That's some right. Some people don't really like all that. That's Especially right. Especially the dressing will That's get right. in there. <laughs> some schools have actually gone to trayless uh, operations, and so, and so we're considering that. We're sure. considering that as, as uh, as an option. As, as one of our options in right. terms of a cost reduction. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but always in mind, going back to another topic right. you had earlier, was the, was the retention mm -hmm. and the grade point average uh, of our students. Because research tells us as we compare grade points of students who live with us class for class to students who do not. So freshmen on campus versus freshmen off, sophomores on, sophomores off. Uh, our grade point averages always tend to be a little higher. And on a retention standpoint, in terms of who's here for that sophomore year, who's here for that junior year, class for class, if you live on campus, you always tend to be a little bit better. And so that's what we're keeping in mind relative to student success these days. That's what's really being measured. That has to be factored in, even as we do room and board rates and we consider all the other programming options that we have. Right. There's a lot to consider in when you're doing all of that. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of factors that come into play there. Mm -hmm. um, what about uh, sometimes the impact? You project the, enroll the residents that are going to be in there, but there are peaks and valleys. Are there not over time when you look back? Some, some years you really get more people than expected, and some sort of what, live off campus until things kind of settle down. Right. Uh, there really is, and that's the most uh, probably delicate right. uh, formula that we have to balance in that we do not require freshmen to live in. They can. Mm -hmm. It's a voluntary decision, and right now we're housing around 90, 92% of the freshman class. Our return rate for students is around 41 or 42%. So of the students eligible to come back, if you take out seniors, 
about 42 percent, almost half, are coming back on their own. So our returning students, they get first choice, and then with the space that's remaining, we fill in with freshmen. And so depending on the size of that freshman class, that becomes the challenge. And it seems like about every seven or eight years or so, that freshman class balloons. And then we have to get creative with the space that we have uh, without forcing our continuing students to go to a lottery or something, which other schools do. And we've been creative over the years in, in, in doing that. If I think back to the 70s or so, we, uh, we went to a suite arrangement where we took the end four rooms of a corridor and built a wall, and those four rooms became part of a suite, and we put two additional beds there. By doing that, we created 1,000 additional beds for about the next four or five years, and we got by. Uh, about seven or eight years later, the same thing happened. By then, the suites were gone, and we went to triples. We went to voluntary triples. Any two students who wanted to have a third roommate, we would divide their rate by three instead of by two, so they could save money. Okay. Triples, the industry tells you, you're asking for trouble, because it's always going to be two versus one. Somebody's always going to be on the out, you know, relative to, to people getting along, you know, that sort of thing. <coughs> Excuse me. So we tried triples for a couple years, and then we went, up, went away from that. One year, we actually used hotels, motels in town, where we actually, uh, since they were available and quite willing to have students live there for the semester, we actually housed students there, had a bus service set up, where we would go out and meet with the students until we had vacancies, sure. that sort of thing. But each fall, what it comes down to is, are, have we guessed right on our numbers? And so we have a lot of temporary space. We cross our fingers and rub a lot of rabbit's feet and create a lot of temporary space to include rooms in our Union Club Hotel on campus. We always have 20 rooms reserved, 40 beds, just in case we really miss the, the, the starting number. But we'll house students in uh, study rooms and in some special uh, uh, lounges. Uh, we're not allowed uh, some other schools are allowed to put bunks in a dining room, that sort of thing, and, and house students there. Uh, our fire marshals just won't let us do that. Yeah. And For so, good reason, you know. Yeah, and, and, and in most cases, our temporary space is always more attractive than regular space. So invariably, the student in a motel room wants to stay there, you know, <laughs> or the student in the, in the study room where he has a single wants to stay there, you know, and we always say, sorry, you, you can't do that. <laughs> because what we go through is the, the arrival uh, of the students and then we have the no-shows. These are the kids who say they're going to come but for whatever reason and out of 12,000 you're going to have a variety of things that just come up at the last minute they can't make it. So those first few days of school we have a lot of people calling a lot of people at home saying are you coming where are you you know that sort of thing as it settles out. And so we've gotten actually pretty good at, at, at guessing how many beds we're going to need and, and, and kind of sifting through that whole thing. Right, and experience helps a lot, you know. In a tremendous amount. Around, right? That's right. Um, summer session, the residence halls, how do you, uh, they're not all used during the summer though, are they? Or do you rotate around or? Uh, we do all those things. Okay. We have a lot of renovation taking place during the summer. Right. Okay. Um, we have five dining courts we can now choose from. On an average summer, we'll have about 115 different conferences coming in and out, as small as 20, uh, as large as uh, five or 6,000, what we call a mega group. We always like having a mega group, okay. at least one, yeah. uh, because if you're gonna get ready for 50, you might as well get ready for 5,000, you know, in terms of scope of things. So a lot of planning has to go in place as to when they're gonna arrive, when they're gonna leave, what they want, how much food, uh, how often are they gonna come to campus, that sort of thing. Uh, and so we have a whole separate staff that gets involved with, with conference management. Uh, from a staffing standpoint, our staff are here anyhow. Uh, for the folks who work in our kitchens, um, most of them work there because they can be off for the summer if they want to. So we have a voluntary system where if you want to be off for the summer, you can, and then you rejoin us in the fall. Uh, lately, a lot of those folks do like to be here, and so they can even be doing service work. There's a lot of painting to be done. and. And they bushes like the to be. If there is something available, they'd like to work. Exactly. Right. E exactly. So it is a different time. It's kind of a different season for us. Sure. It's a different uh, customer. Uh, they're short term, uh, but we still have to have that same smile in place. But usually by the end of the summer, we're glad to see our regular folks come by. So it almost provides a motivator for us <laughs> to, to look forward to the regular school year. 
Uh, but a good source of income during the summer oh, for us. Yeah, right. Helps keep room and board rates down. At one time, uh, from occasionally, am I not uh, mistaken, you used to offer commencement, people coming for commencement if they needed space. That's right. Uh, but I don't, I don't know, they still, John, are they still doing that? I don't we, still, we still offer okay. it, but we don't have many takers. Yeah. We had a setting where there actually weren't enough rooms available in town for all the, the family members who wanted to come back for commencement. Right. I remember so, that years ago, I think. That's right. Going back to our entrepreneur days, um, we always had a policy that for our current students, if you were a senior and your parents were going to come back, they could live on campus, probably in your same hall at no charge. And so it was wonderful just to see grandma and grandpa and mom and dad and the kids, and they just got the biggest kick out of coming back and living in a residence hall room, you know, for a couple of days at sure. least, using the, grand, the, the group bathroom, all that sort of thing. And we still offer that actually for our graduating seniors. But what we did several years ago is we started offering this for off-campus students at a nominal fee. If they wanted to reserve a room, they could. And I think our highest take, we got as high as six or 700 folks who would come in and do that to the point it was a little concerned with some of the motels that were in town. So we had a rule that we would not advertise until the 1st of February because by then most of them would be full. They were worried about us taking away some of their business. Mm -hmm. Now there's enough place in town that everybody can get a room uh, if much. they want that. Yeah. And don't you, I remember a student a couple of years ago that worked for me, they know you have to book it in advance, and so oh, yeah. they kind of think ahead. And, that's you know, right, that that's right. That kind of helps out a little but bit. But for our own students, we still offer that as a complimentary yeah, offering. That's very nice. A um, couple things on your other areas. Memorial Union, I think you talked a little bit earlier about that, but that's been the complete renovation. Are some of the spaces leased in there? In some of the spaces okay. are leased. Okay. We did a complete overhaul when it, came, when it came to the food service. We used to have the Union Market, right. which was kind of a cafeteria. And on the wave of the success we saw in the residence halls with the marketplace concept, we needed a different approach there. And so they came up with the concepts that they have, which are uh, uh, Italian with Villa Pizza, and uh, La Salsa nice. with Mexican, and uh, uh, an urban market, a Zia juice kind of an operation. We redid Pappy's, the sweet shop, which is now more of a Johnny Rockets, kind of a 50s kind of a place. We did go with Starbucks. Everybody had to have a Starbucks, which oh, is yeah. extremely popular. And so those have proven to be quite uh, very popular uh, food offerings. But a union building, it's a, it's a union building. It's a very active union building. We have 19,000 people a day who walk through there. About 5,000 will stop to make a purchase. So we're trying to get that up to 6,000 if we can. It's nice that you got that clothing thing that opened in there. You know. We finally have an apparel store for right. the first time in and it's just Purdue history. Because I see people, and you know, the conference people, you, you got the business because they're right there. Otherwise, they go to the village. They would go to the bookstore. Right. Yeah, for the first time, someplace at Purdue is actually getting money off selling Purdue paraphernalia. <laughs> We've had a travel store in there. Yes, I know you did. STA you know. Travel was there right. for a while. Uh, we now have a UPS store right. that has taken its place. But this goes back to when I first arrived and we had a barber shop in right. the Union Building. It was here, exactly, um, I remember that. And I remember the first time I walked in, I said, my Lord, this is really a surprise. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> this was in the late 60s when I came. The it was, it, it, it came and that faded. Now we have video games right. in that same space. Right. Uh, interestingly enough, now the video game use is starting to trail off. And so we're starting to see if there are places in town that might be interested in that space. And so actually we went after optical companies. Neo Vision Optical in sure. some of those places, and so far, uh, no, they're not. They're not really interested. What about now when the N N Vision took where the uh, uh, billiards room used to be? Right, is that uh, the bowling and the billiard? I haven't been down there in a while. Is it used pretty much? It really is. Yeah. It, it, it's a rack and it's roll. It's a nice combination, I think. It is for visitors and and conference people. Yeah, well, you you recall as you used to walk by, you could see. 15 or 20 or 30 pool tables right. all through there. Sure. Uh, we have less than that now. Sure. And it's coupled with a bowling alley. They have neon down there now. They have nighttime bowling. And it's become a very attractive thing on weekends for community, for, for young people and birthday parties uh, to be down there. We actually have a bowling league. We actually have a bowling class that takes place. We actually have a competitive bowling team now that travels and competes nationally in some sure. events. And so it actually is an attractive place that students will go to uh, late at night uh, to bowl. So right. it's, it, it's a very attractive offering. And it's handy offering. too, which is great. Right. On right. campus. Mm -hmm. Very mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. um, 
Ellie Hall Hall and music, any or changes there? I think one thing, you're putting the sprinklers in there. Is that right? Right. Okay. Elliott Hall and music opened in 1940, and, and in its day, it was extremely popular with the Victory Varieties, where we had something before every home football game. So great. John, yeah. oh, I love that. Just, oh, oh. The people who were there loved it. Oh. And we has, and it was so reasonable, and we had... That. Bob Hope was here, you know. Yeah, oh, Bob Hope, right. Frank Sinatra, right. Duke Ellington, right. Jack Benny. We had some of the big names. That's when ticket prices were cheap, and they would travel around, and it was just a perfect venue in its day. And now that's all changed, and now the groups uh, expect bigger crowds. The ticket prices are more expensive, um, and it's harder to attract talent in there. Uh, we, Convocations is the booking agent. We're just the landlords of the building, and right. so... We take care of that building as well as Low Playhouse, Faller Auditorium, and Slater Center for the Performing Arts. That's all a part of the Hall of Music operation. And again, we're the landlords of the building, so we want to try to get as many acts in as we can, but it's more challenging unless you're catching an act between Indianapolis and Chicago. Periodically, we get lucky. And so the Lady Gaga thing that occurred this year was just a stroke of luck. Even though she canceled the first time and came you back, luck twice. I guess you know <laughs> the students loved. Every once in a while, we get good groups for the students, sure. and we'll catch a performer. Robin Williams uh, came here several summers ago, several Mays ago, and and, and was a hit. Hundred dollars a, a price, a ticket for the premium seats, and we had people from all over the country coming for that particular kind of a concert. We tried to get Tony Bennett here. The I left my heart in San Francisco. Tony Bennett. Uh, we could only sell a few hundred seats and he had to cancel. Um, the one predictable act that sells out still today, the one predictable, is current country and western. So Brad Paisley will sell out, Toby Keith will probably sell out, but if you get uh, Barbara Mandrell or uh, Randy Travis, uh, probably not. not. Probably not. Right. We encourage them to try to get other kinds of things. We encourage them to get Prairie Home Companion. And that ended up being a hit, and they've been here twice. Um, uh, we're currently encouraging uh, thoughts along the lines of Wheel of Fortune or Jeopardy might be a nice venue to, to think about a, a venue like that. Try to get people in the seats, because it's, uh, it's two-thirds self-supporting, so we need people coming in and occupying sure. the seats. What's caused to happen is they have branched out into the video production business. And so the coaches shows, the Danny Hope show, the Matt Painter show now are being done by the people, the folks in the Hall of Music. They have a video production. They actually do the jumbotron at football games. Right. That is, by any other name, a six camera television show, scripted with advertisements that go up at the right time, instant replays, that's all being called by a director up in the pavilion, and it's being done out of a uh, production suite in Mackey Arena where they have all the equipment uh, for doing all that sort of thing. Same way with Mackey Arena and the video board. So they've really branched out into the whole video uh, mm -hmm. television area, which is an interesting area that I've become acquainted with. Very expensive, very expensive equipment mm -hmm. that they have to, I can still remember having to purchase uh, the first big piece of equipment, my first month in this position, and they wanted to buy a telephoto lens, to a telephoto for a TV camera. And uh, to put it in perspective, if, if you watch a football game at home on TV and they're measuring for a first down, uh, on your TV screen, it actually, you can actually see the chain links of the chain as they bring it. You can see the logo on the football, and that's being shot by a camera way up on top of the press box. And it requires a telephoto lens that's about this, this long and about this big around, and that lens costs $100,000 for one lens. And so I gulped and sign the requisition, and we now have one. But it turns out it's expensive for everybody, and so now we're in the, the equipment rental business, and so we rent our lens and all this other equipment all over the Midwest, as a matter of fact, to a lot of television production companies, and it's become another source of income for the Hall of Music. So another interesting operation that started out just as that facility did. Right. But now the facility itself needs to be upgraded. It, yeah. was, it was open the same year that Radio City Music Hall opened, built by the same architect who I met about 12 years ago as we went out to Radio City and toured it. They had just finished a $70 million renovation of the facility, and we have yet to spend anything on our facility. And so we're woefully behind, and fire alarm sprinkling system is the one that it now looks like this coming summer we're going to have a, uh, an alarm system put in, 
and I just found out within the last uh, few weeks that we're now get, we have found the funds for a sprinkler system also. So That's we'll have amazing. a sprinkler fire alarm system. But what that's bringing with it is because we're going to put sprinklers in, it means we're going to have to put scaffolding in the audience chamber to actually get up to the ceiling to install the sprinklers. And as long as you're doing that, maybe it's time to replace the seats. And if you're going to replace the seats, well, maybe it's time to be compliant with the ADA policy of, of a cross exit aisle. So all of a sudden, it is starting to open up all these other windows of things that require a lot more money. So it's going to be interesting. How it, how it to, fans to, out, right? <laughs> right. We really, we really need some private funding. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but it happens to be a facility that has no real affinity group. So the the Glee Club that performs there, they have their own group, and Convocations has friends of Convo for their particular group, and bands, in a similar fashion. And so we have yet to find that person who walked across the stage for commencement, that says, "I love this facility." Here's five million dollars, you know. We can go with it. Spruce right? it up a little bit, you know, <laughs> that sort of thing. Oh, <laughs> Slayer Center, that sort of stays the same. And I've talked to a couple of people that I've interviewed, and as they look back on it, they've always enjoyed that facility and uh, for the activities, and also when they used to bring their their children there to use it. Mm -hmm. So it, it's really it's very nice. It is a very unique facility. It sure is. Uh, with funding from Games Slater, who invented fiberglass, mm -hmm. and because a lot of fiberglass in those days was be, was being used for musical instruments, I think it was R.B. Stewart that convinced him this is the site, this is the kind of facility, and we'll name it for you. And I think it opened up in around 1965 Something or like so. That, yeah. And hasn't really been upgraded much since then. There actually is a band practice room underneath, and the band actually uses that for practice all year round. Mm -hmm. uh, used a lot, obviously, in spring and summer. It's become the location for the community's Fourth of July celebration. That's right. Uh, a unique facility. It is. Uh, before football games, it's the, one of the spots to be, that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, but it's another a, landmark on campus. It's a great campus. location. Mm -hmm. That's perfect. Mm -hmm. um, the faculty fellow program, I was going to ask you a little bit about that. It's changed somewhat because I think with the dining facilities, uh, being mm -hmm. consolidated. Mm -hmm. um, have you heard any comments on that? Or sure. It's still, it's a great program. Yeah, but it's just changed because a lot of the events that used to be in the halls, uh, we mentioned earlier, are not yeah. held, like Winter Whispers. And, and you have many years of contribution to that program, so I know <laughs> right. it's near and dear to your heart. Right. Uh, it started in the mid 60s by, by President Fred Hovde, who brought the concept back from Oxford to have the faculty outside of the classroom associate with students. And it was intended for faculty, and for many years it was. And then we had as high profile folks as a lot of deans and vice presidents were fact fellows wanting to meet with the students. Sure. Uh, it's continued over the years. It's one of my favorite programs, and so I've kept, kept an eye on it for sure to make sure we maintain it. But it, several things have changed. First of all, uh, we found that faculty members don't necessarily get a lot of credit sometimes for the amount of time they spend in the faculty fellow program. They're rewarded more for research and for writing and for mm -hmm. teaching, and somehow it doesn't rank up. So as you get newer folks coming in, it doesn't quite catch the flavor and the use of their time, particularly if they have a family. We can understand mm -hmm. that. Uh, so f staff were then in included in the faculty fellow program to the point that today I think about two-thirds of the program is probably staff and about one-third are faculty. It worked best when we had our intimate environments with, with the dining areas within each of the halls. Nowadays, with our, with our neighborhood concepts, it's a little bit more of a challenge. And so I think a lot of groups like to have a designated evening, a Thursday night, where the fact fellows uh, in concert with the resident assistant still will gather some students. But it takes more effort. It takes more uh, of an effort. And so we're trying to work out ways to maybe have food more readily available so there can be additional meeting sites uh, someplace. Our student government in, in each of our halls isn't as strong as it used to be. So I, quite often faculty fellows would be invited for meetings. Right we used to have those lovely dinner dances where we all dressed up and for a very nominal fee had a, had a sit down dinner where we had Mary Lou Billsborough teaching us manners and we all had to go through etiquette training. I and, remember her. <laughs> And, Not for the train, but I remember her. Uh, oh, she, yeah. she left her mark on a lot yeah, of people. She sure did. Um, and, and, but those were, the, sure. in some respects, the good old days with, uh, with a lot of uh, uh, close-knit uh, associations between faculty, staff, and students. Uh, the president, I remember Art Hansen coming out to lunch 
and doing a math problem for one of the students in the lobby of Wiley he Hall. To, he was a Peck fellow over at, um, at uh, Tarkington. Uh, he was. And, and uh, he, he and his wife, Nancy, he and Nancy. used to come quite often. Yes, they would. Sure. Yes, they were. Uh, um, and for many years, and in fact, we've just gotten back into the appointment letter is supposed to be coming from the president to try to give some prominence to this particular appointment, and that kind of right. faded uh, as we have new leadership involved, that sort of thing. So it, it's been a challenge, I can tell you, to, to try to keep people understanding uh, the value of it and understanding it. And participate in it, too. And participating. And continue to participate. And, and to get new new folks involved. Right. Right. But we have a lot of, a lot of true, dedicated, long-term folks who have been with that. But it's that newer brand, and there are there are some folks there f from the staff, you know, periodically. Right. But I we still use that as one of our strong programs that we can proudly talk about. That many schools have just given up trying to get organized, um, but we still have that going on. Right. Good. Um, I'm going to talk a little. You know, the um, your official host for visiting coaches. <laughs> I think that's mm -hmm. for the researchers. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, mm -hmm. That goes back to, uh, I guess, the early 80s. And uh, this is a program that was started by Red Mackey when they opened Mackey Arena in 1967. Okay. And his intent was to have a, a host, a full-time staff member, host the visiting team. At many schools, still this day, it's, it's, the, it's the newest freshman manager who gets saddled with having to spend time with the visiting team. He thought Purdue was better than that. He thought we were a class operation. And one way to do that was to have a full-time member host them. And so several people had done that. I had a friend of mine doing it. And in the early 80s, turns out I was uh, working my way up in the housing operation. And I was giving a lot of speeches to student groups on leadership and motivation. And a friend of mine was doing this, and he was leaving the university. And he said, you know, you might want to do this because you can see a lot of real-life examples of motivation and leadership on the basketball floor. You can hear the speeches at halftime. You can see and hear how it's being done for your speeches. You might want to look into this. He said, but it's time intensive. You got to be there early, you stay late, that sort of thing. I said, I, I can do that. So I thought, I'm going to try this. And so I started doing it. And it was just fascinating just to meet all these coaches and to see the different styles and to see how they take care of adolescents and to see how their staff responds to them and see the inner workings. And so you get to see what goes on. Um, Bob King, who still goes to games but was an assistant coach many years ago, used to always call it, you know, this feels like it's backstage at the opera, just to see what goes on here. Right. And so you get to be a part of that. Sure. And so my duties uh, basically are that I, I uh, send a letter in advance, always saying, looking forward to having you back in Mackey Arena again. And then I'm there two hours before every game to meet the, the, the coach yep, assistants Mackey, you meet at yeah, just game day. Not, not at shoot-around, sometimes they come in a day before to shoot around, but, it, but it's game day, two hours before the game to meet the bus as the coach and the staff and the players all get off the bus and take them to their locker room. And they have a locker room and right next door is the coach's locker room. We have two locker rooms for them. And I sit outside the locker room in case they need anything. And so from uh, tickets, we'll call tickets for other fans that are coming in for parents, to training things that they might need, to ice bags, to tape, to um, one coach used to have me always had to find a place for his wife's mink coat that she always liked to wear to games, a secure place. And sometimes before we had cell phones, they always wanted to call their kids just before the game or something. They wanted to make some long distance phone calls. Or a coach was arriving late and needed a place to park. It's just all these kinds of things. Can you do it only? Do you have anybody help you? No, I'm it. Oh, okay. But I know who to go to. So I know who to and it got a cell phone now too. Find the game manager. That's right, and I have a cell phone. Right. Um, so then it's a matter of then sure. getting them uh, into the game, and then I always sit uh, either right behind their bench, or in the scores area somewhere. There's there's two teams that will not let me sit behind them. Uh, all the rest, if there's a seat available, do. Um, and I can tell you the two teams. Uh, one is uh, was Dean Smith with North Carolina. And he turned around and saw me and he said, John, nothing personal, but I'm superstitious. And I just can't have anybody from the, from the home team sitting behind my bench. So would you mind moving? No, nope, not fine. And the second, predictably, was Bobby Knight. And uh, that occurred, not that he minded, except uh, there was a, a game took place. And it was a nationally televised game. And for that game, there were some Purdue people who wanted to sit 
close to the team, but weren't used to sitting down there. And so they ended up sitting next to me, right behind the bench. And the person sitting next to me, as it turns out, got a little too vocal during the game to the point where Bobby Knight turns around and addresses me that I don't need any officiating behind my bench. Would you guys mind moving? Not at all, sir. We're glad to do that. And so we moved. My friend apologized for the rest of the, still does to this day. <laughs> and we laugh about it now, but we don't. So we go back out at halftime. We make sure they get statistics and everything they need uh, back out for the game. After the game, uh, there's media to deal with. There's statistics to deal with and, and all those sorts of things, making sure they get whatever they need and then back on the bus. Normally it takes about an hour after the game until it's all settled. So it's normally about a five-hour experience. Then I have a letter that I send. I have a win letter and a lose letter, depending on how the game comes out. Very and nice. so over the years, um, I've had many coaches write and thank me for the hospitality. Uh, I have more letters received from one coach than any other, and it's Bob Knight, interestingly enough. But I have three notebooks full of all the letters that I've received from lots of these folks Great. over Keep the years. And so it's a good collection uh, right. for me to have. Right. And 20, it's over 25 years now I've been doing this, and so I've met a lot of very interesting I would people so. along the way. And you know, we're looking for the, the opening is supposed to be 11-11-11, uh, November 11th, 2011. I've told that to people. You know. Of Mackey Arena. Mm -hmm. right, exactly, so mm -hmm. we're hoping for that. That's right. <laughs> Looks to be on time. In the uh, meantime, we're playing amongst all the renovation that goes on, and that's interesting too. I live, I drive by the barrel. 101. <laughs> uh -huh. Every day. Every day. Oh, the community involved. I thought just, are you still on the Lafayette, the leadership uh, board of directors for that? Uh, yes, I've, oh, I've, good. I've okay. joined the board of leadership Lafayette, the community group that kind of basically trains uh, young professionals really sure. to uh, serve on boards in a lot of the civic groups and United Way agencies. And uh, I'm looking forward to that. In fact, we've just established a brand new youth leadership award. Good. That was my first board meeting. <laughs> Uh, I asked the question, it seems like we ought to be thinking about you, young leadership and maybe, and maybe trying to grow some folks into thinking about serving on boards, good idea, why don't you do it? And so uh, we'll be selecting our first Youth Leadership Award this coming May uh, from somebody from the community. Oh, but I've always wanted nice. to be a part of the community mm -hmm. from the Volunteer Bureau, which I joined when I first got here, to uh, Legal Aid and, and some of the other yeah. community uh, one of the things I think it's nice, you're the chairman of the United Way, and you're the one that started the, the post posters for the campus line. That's wonderful. Yes. <laughs> Everybody really likes them. Well, thank you. Yeah, that's... And it just enhances it rather than the run-of-the-mill, you know, United Way. Yeah, it, just it goes back to, uh, we used to always have a dean and an administrator, and I happened to, I was the junior chairperson the year that Purdue did not meet its goal. The first year and only year that it's never met its goal. And previously to that, President Bering, even sometimes out of his own pocket, would kind of write a check to make up the difference, just so we always met our goal. But apparently this was the second year in a row they were kind of short, and he determined he wasn't going to do it, and so I was up next. So he calls me into his office and says, John, whatever you need, whatever resources you want, you just let me know, but this can't happen again. We've got to change the way we do the campaign. So I went down and met with Dave Brannon down at Purdue Marketing and Communication and said, we've got to think this thing through. So we just put our thinking caps on and came up with a poster idea that if you just would return your card, uh, you would get a, ni a very nice poster. And then we came up with other kinds of, uh, we changed the, uh, the actual uh, donation card. Uh, the format of it made it easier to understand. We uh, re reinforced and rewarded captains. You got a t-shirt, I think, if you were a captain. We got, gave out awards if you got all your cards in, if you had the most amount of money per capita. Right. We just built some incentives into it. And as it turns out, it took off. And the posters have become collector's items uh, for a lot of students, and the campaign has been very successful ever since. Right. And he called me back in a, to his office, I still remember, and gave me a Purdue watch for turning the campaign around and making it so successful. So Super. The little moments. <laughs> the little moments. A uh, couple committees, you, still, you served on the Senate Student Affairs Committee. That's just this year or have you been on it for a while? No, as, as, a, as a result of my position, the Vice President okay. for Housing and Food Services, you're automatically a member and you serve on the Student Affairs Committee. Uh, and historically, you know, University Senates have always been a part of institutions where the faculty 
kind of collectively can kind of give thoughts and directions to, to the university, and they have a variety of committees. One is student, is student yeah. affairs, right. and so I get to serve on that particular committee uh, with student interest. It normally includes some faculty representatives, and then some administrators, and then some students from Purdue yeah. Student Government. It's uh, a very logical committee to, for you to be on. It is. Most right. recently, they work on a code of conduct that they're going to try to institute, but it's uh, also dealt with uh, some conduct issues, uh, just a variety of things on, sure. on the student side of things. Right. And then that campus community, for researchers, just what that campus community partnership, partnership committee? Yeah, what, what's the nature of that committee? That goes back to about, um, I guess, five or six years ago, seven or eight years ago, where there was uh, some thoughts in the community were starting to emerge uh, relatively about housing. Yeah. Uh, in, in terms of the students who lived in the Chauncey neighborhood areas and close to campus, um, maybe the university should be a little bit more involved with, with campus and campus off-campus housing to maybe monitor these students, that sort of thing. So out of that, uh, myself and Jan Mills, who was actually a, a council person at the time, uh, representing the Chauncey area, uh, she and I got together and started thinking about ways that we could improve communication. And so we uh, actually kind of ended up with uh, a communication uh, uh, review, uh, looking at housing, and basically found that we just needed to be communicating better yeah. with each other. And so we started having meetings. And so the folks in city council would have their representatives and the folks in the university would have their representatives. And again, trying some new things. I still remember Jan and I, we came up with a, a snow shovel campaign. And that was, that uh, if students lived on a block, it was kind of a block captain concept, that if you lived on a certain block in town and you were willing to shovel snow for this coming winter, uh, we would give you a snow shovel and Jan and her friends would cook you a lasagna dinner at the end of the semester. And so the whole concept was to get people being more responsible for their neighborhood, for their block, that sort of thing. And sure enough, we I finally identified, I think, three areas where they were willing to do this. And don't you know, that winter, we hardly had no snow. <laughs> I think we had two snows all winter long. But in these locations, the kids were good. They came out and shoveled the snow, and she cooked them dinner. And it was really the start uh, of, of a very nice cooperative effort between the city, which actually has continued to these days. Now, Jan became mayor right. after that, and I became uh, in, in my current position. And we've stayed in touch. And it's, it used to be the Campus Community Issues Committee. Now it's called the Campus Community Partnership Committee. And at that committee, uh, we talk about housing master plans and uh, what the university is thinking relative to its master plan. The community talks about its strategic, strategic plan. Communication. And it's so it's, really a, it's, a, it's become a, an, a very, very effective communication tool. We meet each once each semester now. And it's, again, people from City Hall, people from the campus and students, a very unique gathering. Many, we're told, many campus communities would love to have something like this, but they can't ever get the folks at the same table at the same time. Very good. We do that. We have a welcome back uh, exercise that we do. It's the first weekend, I think, of classes. They go well, right? Where we I gather people and we put information together about recycling as well as ordinances and we knock on doors and, and hand that off to students, that sort of thing. Super. Yeah. And uh, the Catalyst Award, that's very nice for housing and food services. Very nice. Catalyst Award. Thank you. Thank you very much. We, uh, uh, we've uh, worked hard in the whole human resource area, sure. but a, a piece of that was diversity and diversity efforts. Um, and I've come to think that, you know, we're all these days aware of diversity, but it's like a lot of things. We just need to be reminded once in a while. Right. And so uh, this is our second effort. Our, our, our first was called Building a, a House of Diversity and it was a fable about giraffes and elephants living in the same house and how their needs are different. And we had staff that we called pro-actors, and we actually had them work with Catherine Burke downtown, and she taught them how to act a little bit, and we actually would put on performances. And that became very popular with a lot of folks on campus. So this 10 lenses, it's a way to look at living and working in a multicultural environment. Uh, it's kind of the same takeoff, and uh, we're getting, uh, very interesting take on it. Athletics has had all their staff and coaches sit through it. We've had several academic departments. Now we're having the community, the, the uh, local real estate association, had the performance done for them. The county 
uh, sheriff's department is now going to have it done for them. And so this is the particular offering that won the, uh, won the Catalyst Award, which is an award in the treasurer's side of the university for innovative efforts in, in diversity awareness. And so we're really tickled and Very proud nice. of them yeah. for doing that. And now we're come to the bottom, the next stage. The next stage. Right. Not uh, Wells Fargo, your stage. That's right. <laughs> You're on the stage. Right. Uh, June 30, I'll be retiring after okay. almost 39 years. And so, um, uh, you're going to stay in the community. Kind of looking for that. Uh, we, we are. We, okay. we think we're going to use this as our home base. Good. Uh, our son lives here, and he has three children. So we have three grandkids, okay. 11, 8, and 5, great ages. And so we can spend more time with them. Uh, we do like to travel, so I think we'll be traveling uh, several times a year from here. Uh, I'll still be on the board for Leadership Lafayette. I'll still be hosting coaches. Um, Good. I'm currently talking in a actually new facility. <laughs> in a new facility, right? I'm actually currently talking with folks in the Alumni Association, and maybe there might be some possibilities there since I know so many students right. in so many places, and I know a lot of campus uh, processes also. Uh, maybe there's something we could do there, maybe on a part time basis uh, uh, for them. Nice. But the call at the golf course is certainly out there, and, and uh, so I, I don't. Katie, right? That's right. <laughs> Morgan Burke and some others, I don't think I'll have any problem. Uh, uh, Martin Jiski actually likes to play, and so we've played several times oh, well, already. That sounds good. Maybe yeah. Drew Brees will join you because he plays golf. Yes, he'll be here this summer, actually. <laughs> yeah. So I'm looking forward to changing yeah. the pace a little bit, too. John, I want to thank you very much. And is there anything that you want to add that I've forgotten? Or, uh... No, I don't think so. I, I, I came in August of 71, and a lot of things have changed from what we provide students and how we think of our students. And, uh, and the parents that come with them and all that sort of thing. Um, I guess as I arrived and I've, it's kind of unusual to be in one place that, that long anymore. Right. But as I arrived and I thought about what Jack Smalley and Bob Page and Bill Berner and some of those folks were kind of handing off to us, uh, my goal was to, to keep it what it was and maybe make it better if we could. And I have a great sense of uh, pride and accomplishment in, the, in that I think that we've done that. I think. Um, but with a lot of great staff and, and good people along the way, and, and I'm most grateful to all of them. Good. John, I want to thank you again. Very nice. Boiler up. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, John. <laughs>